ever a Kaiser report is started without a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, we need a big fat disclaimer wherever we go. Uh, so I guess we should uh, begin. Okay, start the show. Yeah. Hey, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Yeah. It's uh, so apocalyptic. Everything is crashing at the same time. I look around the world, the bankers are still up there nefarious tricks, and bankers are getting away with all kinds of underhanded trickery. It's all looking quite grim and dire. Uh, Stacy! <laughs> <laughs> That's the first intro I have never written. <laughs> I usually write it. Yes, so. I free wheeled it. I improvised it. I channeled it. Hey, first of all, I'd like to say, in memory of Gordy Howe, man. Yes. Let's hear it. He's a hero. He's a Canadian hero. You know, I grew up playing hockey. I played in British Columbia for one summer. Uh, we near the Penticton area with the, the monster that lived in the lake. Didn't see the monster. Drank a lot of Molson Golden. Fantastic summer. So, there's Gordy Howe, who's a major, major hero. And uh, just recognize that at this time. He's trying to get brownie points here. Um, so let's uh, start with the headline because we're talking about gold. Gold is the theme of the night, big gold, gold money. Um, and I want to turn to a headline that I saw a few weeks ago and it just keeps sticking in my head. And it really uh, you know, sets the scene of what we see in the monetary world, the financial I world. And I know. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, classic. Okay. <laughs> the headline reads, Vancouver's freak show property market. I love that word freak show because this is exactly what our world has become. It's a freak show wherever you look. And this, they talked to some guy, he's a real estate agent, Brian Yan, and he's riding the wave of property market boom. And he estimates that prices in Vancouver, in his area where he sells, has, has risen by 120% in the past five years. Um, he says it's great for business, but admits it's irrational. If you look at the prices and the graphs, it's off the charts. Of course it's a freak show. It's a, it's a, it's a mighty freak show. And where is this freak show? Where's the genesis of this freak show? You know, talking about hockey, how about this guy Mark Carney? Okay, he was here. He was out the Bank of Canada. He was pumping up the money supply. You know, you go back to his hockey career. Goalie, goalie. Need I say more? Puck to the head, puck to the head. <laughs> <laughs> what, what has he got in terms of sensible policies? You know, I don't know. Just, you know, I played with goalies before. All they say is throw things at me. Hey, throw things at me. Throw things at me. Well, how about throwing a decent monetary policy at us? Instead of all this malarkey going down the road of money printing, and they're feeding the bubbles. Then they use the asset, inflated asset value to borrow more money to increase the bubble. Anyone from Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> There's one person. Any Vancouver person? Okay, well, how do you feel about your bubble? Are you in denial? Are you living the bubble? Are you living the bubble dream? No. Hello? <laughs> oh, he wants it to pop. He yeah. says he wants it to pop. Yeah, well, then, uh, so then Carney goes over to uh, Bank of England. They pay him big bucks, and what does he do? Like, <laughs> they pump up this enormous property bubble in, in, in the UK. It's yeah. the only policy they have. But they print money. It's a freak show, right? But if we all look they at... They give a bad name to freak shows. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at Venezuela, we, everybody laughs. The, the you know CNBC will laugh at Venezuela and say, look at their food prices. It's going up 20% a year, 30% a year. Well, your property prices, are, which are just as basic need, you know, shelter is a basic need, just as much as food. So why do we look at uh, Venezuela and say that's that's a freak show, but we don't see the own, our own freak show here with housing? Yeah, I mean, usually, you know, we have charts to go in our show, and uh, you know. But low tech. Usually, you do like some interpretive dance. Yeah, if we the, can't get the guys the, the, because they're. See, the, people want an interpretive dance. <laughs> yeah. Do it. Yeah. 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 Do the housing market yeah. chart. Yeah. Directors are all spoke to me on our show. It's you know, true. Right there. So you know, here's a chart here. It's all all the derivatives, interest rate derivatives, global GDP. See, global GDP is flatlining. It's like somebody's dead. They're beneath their eyes. They're beneath their eyes. They're dead. They're on the operating table. They have all their internal organs ripped out, and they're dead. There's no global GDP. Now look at this top line. It's global derivatives. <laughs> Yeah. 
Wait until you see him do the gold dance later. The gold dance later. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is really, it sums it up in one glorious uh, image of, uh, this is, see, bankers get paid on this line. You know, people say, well, why do bankers create so many worthless derivatives and bonds? It's because they get a fee. They get a fee to, to, to sell bonds. And there's any, any problem in the world is solved by selling more bonds. If, if there's a war, there's a conflict, let's sell more war bonds. There's a downturn somewhere, let's sell more bonds. Let's securitize, let's monetize. Uh, and because they get a big fat fee. And that big fat fee goes into things like UK property, Vancouver property, Van Gogh. I mean, Digliani sold for $180 million? Hello, Medigliani? I mean, maybe a Picasso. But a Medigliani. <laughs> 180 million? Are you mad? <laughs> so where's the price of these things going? They're going to go down into the uh, flip side. And then you have that collateral value. It loses all this collateral value. And you have a freaking crash. And what's going to do well in a crash? I would posit there's only one money. It's only been good for 5,000 years. And of course, I'm talking about gold. Oh, yeah. oh. Very nice. Right. Okay. Very nice. What else? Now, so I'm on you talk, feel good. Yeah, you talked yeah. about the derivatives and the debt. So, yeah. continuing on this theme of <laughs> our uh, freak show economies and how freaky um, everything is turned upside down from what it used to be. Remember, we used to have jobs. Does, did anybody used to have a job here? <laughs> <laughs> My parents did. Um, and they used to have like create wealth and stuff like that. Now everybody I know just tweets all day. I don't know what else anybody does, but somehow. Where have all the Zamboni drivers gone? <laughs> but the house prices, I guess, you know, everybody extracts the equity. But here's the headline from today Debt to income ratio ticks down to $1.65 for every dollar Canadians earn. It says here, you. Statistics Canada said Tuesday the debt to disposable income ratio was 165.3% for the first three months of 2016, down from 165.4% in the fourth <laughs> quarter of the last year. <laughs> so they're saying don't get too excited by this 0.1% downtick because apparently this always happens in the first quarter anyway. But um, that's the highest level that we've ever actually seen it at, said Laurie Campbell, the CEO of Credit Canada Debt Solutions, in an interview. I don't think we should take any comfort in the fact that it's moved slightly. Right, well, I mean, these governments uh, have gotten into the habit of uh, publishing completely bogus numbers. You know, I know in particular in the U.S., for example, yeah. in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's pretty well known that when they talk about people employed or unemployed or not employed, they don't include people that have stopped look looking for work, right? So yes. The number of people that are actually of able body ability to work that are not working, it's in excess of 100 million. But they've, hit, they've been able to hide it because of monetary policy the freak show that we're talking about. And here's the important line here. This is the most important, and it's kind of buried down deep, but I found it, and I'm going to put it up here prominently. Income and debt increased at the same rate, Statistics Canada said. <laughs> Household net worth rose 1.2% in the first quarter to $9.633 trillion, driven by the gains in the value of real estate. So there is no income, there's only debt increase, and then they said, oh, look, our, 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 inc our, our wealth has gone up. Look, you can't have capitalism without capital. And you can't have capital without savings. And you can't have savings without an interest rate that pays people to save money. Now, if you don't have any of those things in place, you have no capital, no capitalism, and no competition. The reason prices are also going up is because of gougeflation. Prices are being gouged because competitors are being merged out of existence because of all the free money that's being made available to them from their friends at the central banks. So you have merger, 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 less stock. The stock market capitalization is shrinking. So yeah, prices are going up, but not because competitively companies are doing better on earnings. No, they're manufacturing fake earnings by buying back their own stock. Again, with free money given to them by their friends at the central banks, like Mark Carney, the plucked in the head damn central banker who's now in the Bank of England, who came from here, who is a shitty, you know, Ivy League goalie for Yale, and lost a lot of games. I don't know why you should give him a job. The guy can't, can't stop a freaking beach ball. <laughs> Why has he got a job? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, talk about, you know, Jacques Plante. There was a goalie. You know, there was a trend center. Uh, no? Yes. <laughs> this is Toronto. I, mean, I, 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 I used to watch the Ranger games they, they, with Gump Worsley from the Minnesota North Stars. He was the last goalie not to wear a mask. So his, his, his face looked like an old shoe. <laughs> you know, Bernie Cheevers from the Boston Bruins, he had all those scar marks on his, on his face mask. Gump Worthley lived that. 
Uh, and one time you see, we, this is really Max's ambition to have a hockey show. show. <laughs> <laughs> so let's continue on this in terms of like uh, how precarious are not only are, do we have the precariat, i.e., people who don't have any incomes, real stable incomes like we used to have, our parents used to have, or our grandparents used to have. They, the, the worker, the millennial sort of generation now are like Uber drivers and then Airbnb hosts and you know, very precarious <laughs> incomes. Um, but on the other hand, you have uh, people like relying on their assets increasing. So here we have, they talk about while their assets in Canada may be appreciating, the numbers show that Canadians now owe almost as much as the entire economy is worth. One final ratio to note, Canadian household debt is inching ever closer to hitting 100% of nominal GDP, with the ratio rising 4.6% over the past year to 98.6%. So remember when the last disaster happened, the financial crisis of 2007-2008, and all of our property markets, uh, stock markets, everything is up past where it was then. But our the debt loads is $57 trillion more debt in 2016 than there was in 20, 2007 before the crash. Right. So this isn't this a sort of a, a moment where it can get very unstable very fast? It, 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 yes, absolutely. So let's, let's put this into a broader historical context. You had in the 1970s inflation and a central banker named Paul Volcker at the Fed who raised interest rates and snuffed out you know, the, the incipient inflationary threat. In came, you know, the, um, you could buy a treasury bond at that point with a 16% yield, 17% yield. And then comes Reagan, Reaganomics, uh, Thatcher in the UK. The process of deregulation begins. The benefits of having raised rates during that period of time begin to kick in. Rates start to move down. So you have a bond market rally really in place since the early 1980s. It's one of the most extended, it's one of the most it's longest <coughs> rallies in the history of financial markets. But as the bond prices continue to uh, move up, as the yield continues to move down, that means every time you have a problem, like a national government, if every time they screw up, they can simply repackage all those screw ups into a new security and extend the maturity at, at, a, at a different and lower interest rate. And on paper, it looks like we're paying less. But you're just borrowing from today, uh, from, you know, borrowing from the future to pay today. And as long as that 30, 35, 40 year rally in bonds continue, it masks the damaging effect of this non-policy of non-accountability. And so, so now we're at the point in this 21st century of going into negative interest rates. So you're paying governments to take your money. You're locking in a guaranteed loss. And this is another reason why gold is doing so well at the moment, because the old argument that, well, gold pays no yield, it pays no interest, it just sits there and does nothing. I'm Warren Buffett, and I just, I hate gold because he bring it out of the ground, and then he put it back in the ground, and I, I, I like insurance companies, I like compounded interest, I like crony capitalism, I like, you know, but now, with negative interest rates, having, paying no interest, is actually you're making up one one and a half percent, two percent, you know, versus a government bond that's confiscating your wealth on the what. Uh, so this is another reason why it's driving money into gold. Um, yeah, but also we're at that sort of precarious sort of situation where there's so much debt. There's far more debt. There, the system is far more fragile than it was in 2007. On the surface, it doesn't look like that. In, in anyway, in cities like Toronto or Vancouver or New York or. Right. They, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't fix the problems of 2008. Right. They simply made it possible for banks to leverage themselves to ever greater degrees but, and using new quantitative formulas to manage that risk on paper. But, it's not, but at, in 2007, interest rates were at like 5%, and they had a lot to take it down. Yeah, they now, they, down. now they have nowhere. So all the old guys who were around before interest rates began their 35-year decline, and you know a lot of people in the investment community or just ordinary citizens, people won't think it's, it was so easy. And you just keep on making money. You keep on making money on property. Cause, but of course they don't look at the interest rate chart. Maybe you should do an interpretive dance of the interest rate chart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if two of them on one act show might be a bit much. <laughs> but I mean, this is an interesting point is that people have grown used to and they feel entitled to gains yeah. in their property, which is absurd. Uh, you know, there's this concept, especially in the UK, they talk about the property ladder. 
Like once you get on the ladder, it's a one-way ticket to prosperity. You know, I remember as a kid we played a game called Shoots and Ladders. You know, there's ladders and there's shoots. Yes. You, know, you land on the shoot. <laughs> I bet you they it's no longer called that. I bet you call it ladders. ladders. And ladders. <laughs> it's the UK property market presents ladders and ladders. <laughs> location, location, location. And here's a here's a free game, ladders and ladders. There's no downside, there's no risk. It can only go up. Why? Because we're special. Because uh, we were endowed with magical abilities that make it possible for us to simply participate in the real estate market and make perpetual gains at ad infinitum. Because we're God's chosen real estate speculators, we are the people that need to be endowed with perpetual profits. But this magical thinking, it happens always at the top of every market. So in 1987, when I was a stockbroker, you had a lot of that magical thinking. People were convinced that, well, you know, I'm 27 years old. I, I, the bull market's because I, I'm, in the, I'm in the market. I, I created the bull market. It can never go down. Yeah. Then they had the crash of 2007. You were like that. You thought you Yeah, thought I, I thought I was invincible. I thought I was bulletproof, as every 20-year-old kid on Wall Street at that time did. So okay. I went right from, I, and, and in, two, in 1982, I was a proofreader at a rubber stamp factory. <laughs> and then I got a job as a stockbroker. Yeah. And, you know, it's good, different, quite a different is quite in the, you know, at the beginning of the, mo the most powerful bull market in history. Mm -hmm. Then you have 1987, you had the crash. Then, then there was a, a, a moment of, 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 of you know, coming, coming to Jesus type moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you, you were set up for the uh, 94 bond crash. Mm -hmm. Then you had the 2000 dot com crash. Then you had the 2007, 2008 um, subprime crash. And now we're getting ready for this sovereign debt crash. Sovereign debt crash is ready to, ready to blow. But more and more people are also so leveraged like this in a, an asset, and if you want to call it an asset, and we'll, we'll, we won't go into that here, but uh, which is one of the most illiquid in the world. Uh, now I want to turn to the investors in gold now. Suddenly you're seeing these big names like George Soros, uh, gold being the most liquid of all uh, assets in the world. Um, George Soros, Samuel, Stan Drunk, Drunken Miller. I saw CNBC actually wrote Drunken Miller. <laughs> it's hard to not say Drunken Miller. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeff Grunlock. Loads of people are now actually uh, going long gold or actually telling people to buy gold, but in like big, huge quantities. And then I saw this headline, um, which has changed a little bit today after the tragic situation in uh, the UK, but HSBC gold will explode if Britain votes for a Brexit. Uh, gold prices will likely explode if Britons vote to leave the European Union when they go to the polls next Thursday, gaining as much as 10% in a short space. So this role of gold as, um, you know, in the black swan sort of moments and, and things that you can't predict. A lot of people, as we say, because interest rates have been declining for over 30 years, People think they can predict the future. Well, Things so always, prices always go up. You think all this the most liquid out there? That, I wouldn't. You know, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, certainly, the treasury market and the currency yeah. markets are, are, are more liquid. Uh, but it's one of the most actively traded commodities in the world. Uh, could be. But one day there will be a day when uh, nobody will want the treasuries except right. for what, the what, Fed. What the problem is that when suddenly that sea change happens and people see that gold is the place to be, you, you, the price will be whatever the price is, but you won't be able to get any. There won't be any for sale. Yes. Because it's not like people can simply not sell their gold because it's not nobody would want to sell their gold and you're going to have an illiquid market very quickly. So you'll be stuck in a property that nobody wants to, 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 to take off your hands. You cannot, can't sell your property and you won't be able to buy any gold. So you're going to be in this you know, binder. You're going to be completely screwed up. That's why we've said on our show for years that you know, we start talking about gold in the 400s to start accumulating it, you know, averaging over years uh, because when the time comes, to, it, it serves its, its purpose. You know, you, you want to be, you already want to be positioned. You don't want to be, you know, on the outside looking in. Yeah, but actually let's tie that in with Bitcoin now because one of the things that, uh, it wasn't so much like buy gold and, or like buy a property, you're going to make all this money. Buy gold, you're going to make all this uh, fiat money. It's very strange that it's, it's um, in a system filled with so much fraud and so much fragility, inbuilt fragility of this debt-based system that we have. 
um, at, at the end of a, a great run of interest rates down, um, it, it's just it's, it's going to be a system change. And it's not going to be something, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Fiketa, well-known economist, Austrian economist, has said on our show many times, there won't be a fiat, there won't be a fiat price that you're going to be willing to give it. They could give you a trillion Canadian dollars, and you're not going to. There, there won't be gold at any price, any fiat price that you can possibly exchange for. Maybe your house price. There might be a house exchange or something, but yeah, no gold for sale. And, and you know, we're, we're, I think we're at, we are heading to a, a global reset. You had Bretton Woods, you know, after World War II. You had the Plaza Accord uh, yeah. in, in, in the '80s, and you know, at some point. Um, with China knocking on the door, they want to be part of the SDR, special drawing rights. They were part of the World Trade Organization. They want representation in, in, in full representation with their currency. You've got Russia has been massive buyers of gold. China's been buying massive buyers of gold, and and so you you are heading down to a showdown here. And uh, you know you don't want to go to to a, to a gunfight holding a knife. You know you don't want to go to a currency showdown holding some fiat paper uh, because you're going to lose that showdown. So these, these countries are positioning themselves. I mean, Russia obviously is um, actively involved in a, in a pretty you know, heated but, exchange at the moment. But in terms of uh, gold and the whole systemic change, is the other thing you're seeing is, so t in the past few days, you've seen gold prices soaring, but you've also seen Bitcoin yeah. soaring. Like, it was up 30% over the last weekend, and then it's continued to rise. Um, it, it's interesting that Obviously, uh, you know, the governments and the central banks, as they tell you all the time, like they, they, they berate, the, like it's a concern for them if people aren't taking on more debt, that they need people to take on more debt, they want people to take on more debt. So they do have, they do uh, have an interest in not wanting the gold price to look enticing. Well, you, you mentioned gold. Bitcoin there, I mean, the, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper uh, the, the intellectual framework for Bitcoin when it came out and explicitly talks about a, a, a real uh, disregard for the banking system, that they've been irresponsible, that something needs to take its place, and it's a very activist uh, position taken by, by the creator of, of Bitcoin. And we're seeing that play out now. I've said all along that the adoption rate is going to be driven by crisis, yeah. not going to be driven by people for the utility value of Bitcoin, that you can use it to make payments, et cetera, that's great that you can do that. But it's going to be driven, the adoption rate is going to be driven by crisis. So Venezuela is collapsing, the British is collapsing, Argentina, Greece is collapsing, the US is under strain, the UK under this current political environment, there's a lot of strain, there's a lot of Chinese money moving. So this crisis is moving into it. And it, it's kind of uh, it withstood the test of fire in the first few years. Uh, it's 100 million. In, Trader on one exchange. Let's, day. let's let's uh, actually. I think this is a good time to bring on the guest. It's, it's well past so? this. It's time for the second oh half. Oh my God! Sorry, for the second half. Okay, we'll go to a break. I think we should do a throw to break. Do a throw to break. I'm Max Cutter. I do a commercial. Whatever. I'm thirsty. Water. Water. Keeps me. Keeps me hydrated. Keeps me hydrated. I didn't know what the word hydrate means until my girlfriend explained it to me. <laughs> but now I know, and therefore I drink water. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, no, we're inviting up your guest. Oh, how many is this guest? Where am I sitting? Why is he back from Gold Money? Uh, uh, should we put them in the middle? Over there? Put these two bring the, the chairs over closer. <laughs> You're the stagehand, too. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Let's push ourselves back. We'll push ourselves back. But I think you and I should be on the, on the wings, right? Yes, yes. Have our, you sit over there, far left. Are you going to introduce our guest? All right, we're back. Oh, wait, come now. on, come on. We're back. Our guest, George Woo! We have another exciting guest coming up. Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? Good to see you. Um, I don't think. five, four minutes away, so he'll be here. As oh, we were, right. it was a we secret guest. We have a second guest coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but um, I opened my big gold account last night. How'd you like it? Um, it was so... Is that, who, who here has a big gold account? Whoa. Oh, like everybody. <laughs> it's not really easy. I didn't, you know, it's very difficult for me to usually do things online. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty easy. That was the intent. Yeah, it's awesome. So um, let's get into some questions. Do we have some questions prepared? Yes, tell us about your platform. How is it different from, you know, sites that have been around like Bullion Vault, people know that you go and buy and trade gold or silver or whatever. How, how, does your, how does your platform differ from all these other platforms? 
Yeah, I think there's a, a few ways that we differ. Um, the first is that we're really a technology-driven company. So uh, it wasn't enough for us to just offer gold to people. We wanted it to be something that was as cool as using any other technology. So that was kind of the first principle. It wasn't just uh, no one's really competing in the gold space, so by, by offering a gold service, we're going to do well. Um, it was more like, how would a technology company build something like this uh, if they weren't necessarily targeting gold? Uh, and that's really the approach that we took. We, we looked at the, um, you know, the engineering obstacles and, and how one would architect uh, not just a gold trading service, but really a gold network that would enable value exchange, uh, which is ultimately you know, our mission. Is, is we, we, we agree, I, I agree with a lot of what Max says uh, about gold, but I also think that um, one of the interesting things that, that Bitcoin has shown us is uh, that there is, there is a desire on the part of, of you guys, of the citizens, um, to exchange value more effectively outside of the banking system. And so I think the big, the big idea here was to use a commodity money, um, which is what we do with gold. Let me move back so I can peripherally see you both. Yeah. Um, to use gold as our kind of commodity money, but to really try to um, emulate, I think, what PayPal has achieved where you know, you're basically enabling value exchange instantly, you're enabling value exchange across uh, different demographics and different geographies. The next question is, uh, people say that, oh, maybe some country will go on a gold standard. But with, with, with Bitcoin, essentially, people are becoming their own gold, gold standard, right? Yeah, it essentially allows anyone in the world to live on their own personal gold standard. And I think that, that really is the other the other big part of it is we, we show that the math of gold works today. Uh, you know, the first few questions someone will say to me, an, an intelligent person will generally say, uh, wait, so you, you're using gold, but then you're generating all these taxable gains and losses. Um, and that, that's a real, uh, a, a real mistaken notion because um, when you generate a gain in, in any transaction uh, with, your, with your base currency, um, it, a, a much better way of thinking about that is to look at that as an interest rate. Uh, so if you remember, there used to be these things called jobs, but there also used to be these things called interest rates. And, uh, and when we had... Anybody, does anybody remember interest rates? Yeah. Uh, somebody, I, I, I remember. two people. Yeah, I, I remember locking up money at 5.5% in 20, <laughs> 2007 and uh, telling my wife over there, like, we actually, we, we could just wait this out right now. This will be, this, this interest rate, the bank has to work for this money now. Um, but, um, you know, I think that... Um, when we used to earn interest rates, we used to get at the end of the year some type of a tax statement from the bank saying, uh, here is your interest income, and uh, you would then have to uh, add that to your adjusted gross income. And so the same way you should be thinking about gold, when you're using gold and you're generating those little incremental gains over time, if you were to just aggregate those gains, and our software allows you to do that quite easily, whatever that number is, if it ends up being you know, a 4% return on your gold or a 5% return on your gold, and you have to pay a tax on that gain component, you're still way better off. Uh, if you take the Canadian example of the last year, you know, gold's risen by uh, 30%. So even if you paid a very high capital gains tax rate of 30%, uh, you're still better off uh, by around 20% or so. So I think that's, that's kind of the other, the other thing we realized was there was nothing impeding on uh, citizens of the world from using a, a personal gold standard uh, given the advancements we've made in technology. All right, so a question is, or a comment, and I've been reading a lot of your work and looking at the site, and one, one concept that, that came up which is really fascinating is that you, you, you talk about gold in terms of, you know, the, let's, you know, the 99% or the, 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 the <coughs> I don't want to call them poor people, but I mean, people say gold, they, they associate it with wealth, vast wealth. You know, I think of uh, uh, Scrooge McDuck, you know, <laughs> swimming in gold coins with his nephews. Uh, you know, that's kind of the image. Uh, but you are a big believer, or you have this idea about how it's actually quite empowering. If you look at the total opposite end of the income scale, can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so... I, I was a money manager and I've dealt with a lot of um, you know, wealthy people before and I think at some point it just hit me that wealthy people have way too much money. 
Um, you know, it's, it's not properly being um, re redistributed. I, I don't want that to come across the wrong way. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an Austrian. Um, but, but, I, but I do think that you reach a point in your life where um, you no longer want to, ca to have a lot of cash and you want to start taking risks. You want to invest in local businesses, you want to invest in real estate, in stocks, the property ladder, um, things like that. And, uh, and where I, I kind of bring this back to gold is, I view gold as currency, as cash. So it's part of your cash component. And if you're worth you know, millions of dollars, you don't want to have the majority of your wealth in cash. Conversely, if you're just starting out your journey towards uh, upward mobility, and you're saving $15 a month, or $15 a week, or $100 a week, the most important thing for you is cash. But we all know the problem with the world's 190 fiat currencies. And so the idea is that you should be overweight gold as your primary currency, because the most important thing to you is to um, immunize yourself from the volatility in, in energy, um, food, and shelter. And, and say what you say about gold, uh, there are definitely times when gold has speculative fervor. Uh, it's most close, closely correlated to the prices of energy, food, and shelter. Because in staples of life, the gold correlates. So as a savings vehicle, for somebody who has only $500 to save or $100 to save, it makes more sense to be in gold because it's going to keep up with those essentials of life. You're saying that if you are wealthy and you're speculating in a startup company or a property, you're not concerned about the staples of life because they eat up less than 10% of your monthly expense. Whereas if you're lower income, you know, your monthly staples are going to be 40, 50, 60% of your monthly expense. So you, to protect yourself, if you have savings in gold, you are keeping at least, you know, a, a, a parapasu, to use a banking term, with, yeah. with, that, with that level, right? So, how do you get people that, I mean, obviously in a country like India, this is no shock. You yeah. need 20,000 tons of gold by almost a billion Indians. They wear it. For them, it's a completely different mindset. Do you see that now, need, that mindset needs to come to the West more? Or how would you comment that? I mean, it's a bit of a digression. Well, yeah, think? well, in our case, only 20% of our users are from North America. Um, but, I, but I definitely think that if things unfold the way we all uh, believe, then people in the West will, will realize that the service economy, uh, the service economy's percentage of, of GDP is too high. In other words, uh, if push comes to shove, you're not going to pay your phone bill, but you're still going to pay for your burger, and you're still going to pay for your fuel, you're still going to pay your en Enbridge bill. Um, but you won't care about your phone, you won't care about your Spotify, you won't care about those things. And what we've seen on this kind of um, uh, fake money economy is, uh, is, is the service economy has just become, uh, I think, around 70% of, of global GDP. So uh, really, if, if what you're worried about in life is um, parting with your energy, your labor, your time, and accumulating units of what we call bequeathable energy, uh, labor, and time, so whether it's down the line for your future self, or whether it's uh, for your, for your uh, offspring, um, gold is the best mechanism to do so. It's not going to do as well as if you bequeath them uh, a share of gold money stock. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, or, or a share of, say, Google. Uh, but but it'll, 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 you know, you'll be able to say, and, and when this hit, hit for me was I used to love uh, reading um, these old Sears catalogs. And, uh, and I would try to reconcile the prices. And I, you know, the 1922 Sears catalog, you know, the nice house is $1,800. Like, $1,800, what? All right, well, let's, okay, I'll go to my CPI calculator. CPICalculator.gov, $1,800 a year, you know. Wait, that doesn't make sense. It's only like $70,000. I can't get that house for $70,000. Well, okay, what if I took the $1,800, divided it by the price of gold at the time, now I have a weight of gold, and then I multiply the weight of gold by the market price of gold today. All of a sudden, it's three hundred thousand dollars. I can buy a house for three hundred thousand uh, dollars. We did this with old uh, menus going back three hundred years. We did this with um, old covers of New York Times. Uh, and you know, we're getting ready to open a gold money branch. And one of the things we're excited about is is what we call the gold money library. And uh, we've been working really hard on this. But maybe about three hundred different books that we've all read. Uh, myself, Josh, James, Alistair, John Butler. And uh, one of those books is this actual book that I'm talking about. It's, it's 200 years of the New York Times front pages. And if you go back and you get to see you know, the crash of 1929, you get to see the Titanic, you know, all these things. But on almost every page is an advertisement 
for whatever was in vogue at the time. Uh, and you look at the price of those goods, um, whether it's furniture or clothes, uh, and again, you play that trick. You divide to the price of gold at the time, which was generally $20.65, and, and, and then you take the weight of gold, adjust it to the price today, and you go on Amazon, you compare. And, and you find it doesn't work with everything. It's not gonna work with your shaver, but it works with food, energy, uh, and shelter <coughs> the best. Elaborate further on that, because that's an interesting thing we discussed over dinner the other night, is that um, uh, a lot of people, so when uh, gold prices went up to $1,800 and then they fell, and a lot, there were a lot of people who were like, oh my God, I lost everything, and I, I don't have money, and I don't, you know. But you, the, the notion of thinking of your gold holdings in terms of their weight rather than their fiat price. Yeah, so, you know, Google, uh, Apple's down about 30, 36% peak to trough. I don't hear people talking nonsense about Apple every day. Um, you know, the, the peak to trough decline, the peak to trough decline in gold in US dollar terms was about that. Uh, and so it just, it really makes you wonder why uh, it's such a hated asset. I'm sure Max has a few opinions there. Um, but, but really, the, the way to think about it is, do you wake up one day and earn all the money you're gonna earn for the rest of your life, and then decide to put all that money into one stock at one moment, at one minute, at one price? No, you don't do that. Unless somebody really good calls you, your stock worker calls you on the phone like Max used to do, hey? Right, Yeah, exactly. And, and then the 1987 sure, I'll give you all my savings. <laughs> so, so what you actually end up doing, whether you're, you're admitting to it or not, is you're going to be accumulating and relinquishing capital throughout your, your life. We well, you mentioned that gold is uh, hated at time to time. And not, I mean, like Warren Buffett, we mentioned earlier, um, you know, he's openly contemptuous of gold. Why, uh, why, does it, why do people feel in the financial press, especially, that they need to disparage gold? Why, why do you think that is? Any, any thoughts? I'm not sure. OK. I mean, well, the, the debt story has worked since uh, interest rates, and the, their system has been working since 1971, seemingly. <laughs> and they have a lot invested in that, I think. It's your investments. You know, people don't want to lose their, inve well, their investments. Well, somebody said uh, conflict of interest, which I, you know, I think it's a, good, it's a good comment. I mean, it does compete with the, the paper. The yeah. paper bugs are, are, are. But talking of competition, I want to talk about, uh, you, you had mentioned um, the term gold as being, um, it's not elitist, you had said. Is it? Well, it, it, yeah, that's the thing. I, I think there's this misconception which goes back to that. The other thing, back to your original question, is I think we have a different narrative about us uh, with respect to gold. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think one of the old narratives was that, that gold was kind of very elitist and you had to be very wealthy to own gold. I've seen that people say, oh, the Rothschilds own everything. And, uh, yeah. l l let's take a step back. What is gold? Gold is, so first of all, what is life? Uh, getting a little existential here. But, um, you know, we don't exactly know what life is, but we know that there are building blocks of life in our physical, again, I'm talking purely physical, not subjective. So physical, uh, I do believe there, there is a, a physical objective reality. I'm not Elon Musk. Um, so, so in the physical objective reality, we have these building blocks, uh, and, and we've been classifying them for thousands of years, uh, from the time of Aristotle to the time of Newton to the time of Einstein. And there are 92 of them that, that occur naturally in the earth. And we call them elements. And when you studied them in school, it was very boring. You didn't care. And they sounded weird. And they had weird names. But th this is actually the most important thing I find. Um, there are 92 of them. And out of the 92, um, the, the one uh, element, oxygen, is constantly reacting with these elements and, and creating life cycles. Okay, and, and just think of that as a timer, an expiration date, just like your milk has an expiration date. And we're made of elements as well, and that's why we, as an organic uh, uh, a substance, um, you know, basically die, right? We, we have a life cycle. But for whatever reason, out of these 92 elements, the building block, the Legos of life, uh, there are eight that don't react to oxygen. So, so they automatically are immortal to time. Uh, they're immortal, they never die, they'll always exist. And, and out of the eight, um, four are just too rare. They're too rare and they were discovered too late. So it's like, you know, do you want to be on Facebook where everyone's on or do you want to be on the social network that was started yesterday? You know, you don't really want to be alone on that one social network. 
And, and what ended up happening is um, silver, palladium, and platinum are all great, but, but they're all more abundant than gold. So gold is rarer than those three. But more importantly, those three are indiscernible. Uh, before you had sophisticated tools, you couldn't tell the difference between the three. So bringing it back anthropologically, uh, when we went from fighting with each other uh, to organizing ourselves into communities, um, we eventually started to tap into the concept of a market, uh, exchanging value. One clan uh, family would be really good at raising sheep, the other would be really good at collecting wood, and the other would maybe be really good at um, mining for coal. And they would get together in a market and they would exchange value, and, and, and thus a, a price discovery mechanism uh, would, would emanate. And initially, they, there were all these weird barter ratios, you know, I'll trade you three sheep for five sticks, and, and, and this, this was thousands of years of experimentation. Our ancestors experimented with everything. And at some point, without having this amazing scientific knowledge that we have today, they resolved on their own that, hey, you know, this gold thing keeps lasting, you know, nothing else is lasting, and more importantly, um, you know, when a group of people go out into the wild for a week, the guy that is going to look for gold always ends up with the least amount of gold in, in relation to everything else. So that set a proportional relationship between gold to everything else, and it didn't take long. You know, you, you go back to Hammurabi's code, uh, which was about uh, seven or 8,000 years ago, and already then, you know, punishment for everything is gold. You know, if you want to leave your wife, you could, but you had to give her one mina of gold. And, uh, and that's about $20,000 if you, if you convert it to today. And so gold ascended as money. It, it wasn't decided upon. It happened independently, different jurisdictions, different civilizations in a different era. So I think we just lost this wisdom. Uh, it, it's, not like, um, it's not like Josh and I uh, you know, are these geniuses here. We, we basically are just unearthing this old wisdom and allowing gold to, to behave the way it's always behaved, as a currency. Now, in the first half, which you, you missed because you were uh, jetting in. Unlike, mo unlike modern day digital balance sheets, uh, the physical economy is still bound by the scarcity of time. Ah, uh, I and, uh, so I ran out of time, but I'm here. But we were talking about the fragility of the current financial system and the, the debt leverage and stuff like that. And of course, one thing, that I, I don't know if it's been introduced to Canada, but in Europe, we of course have the new concept of bail-ins and people in Cyprus saw themselves be bailed in. So their money was in the financial system, their, their, their cash was in um, their bank, and that money was seized. So presumably if you have your cash, your gold money cash, it's outside the banking system, it's your gold, it's not something that gets seized to bail in all the bad debts that they've accumulated somewhere else. Yeah, so you know, we, 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 we built the system completely outside the banking system. And what that means is that ultimately the ledger that's backing, the digital ledger that's backing all of your metal uh, is just corresponding to actual serialized pieces of metal at breaks. And as you get to use the platform and move the metal around, you've got metal in, in Zurich or London or Hong Kong, you, you are literally transporting um, your wealth into a physical domicile and, and introducing new jurisdiction, new law. Uh, you know, we structure it so every single vault has its own kind of subsidiary in that company. Um, and so I think that's, that's a big thing. I, I remember distinctively living in LA uh, during the last crisis in 08, and, and very wealthy friends of mine, um, you know, their ATM machines didn't work if they had an IndyMac account or if they had a Countrywide account. I mean, countrywide, people don't talk about IndyMac and Countrywide, but living in LA, we remember this because IndyMac was shut down for about eight days. And so, it, you know, from Thursday to Tuesday, imagine not being able to go to TD. And people say, oh, this only happens in Greece. It happened in California. It happened here too, really where? We, we've had situations where our banks have, have had to shut down. Yeah. yeah. Very, very small amounts of time, but it's happened. Yeah, so that's the thing. I, I think it ultimately goes down to the flawed banking system and, and the fact that when you make a deposit in the bank, they, they instantly uh, uh, lend out eight, eight, up to eight, eight amounts, whatever unit you're giving them, they're lending out eight amounts. So, yeah. I, I think that um, you might have already touched on this before, but uh, we, we conflate um, have using a, a payments bank with, with a savings bank, mm. uh, with an investment mm. bank. So most of them are There, there we go. 
So, so most people uh, in, in finance are, are, are generally aware of this concept or this, this law, Glass-Steagall, that separated the investment banks taking more speculative risks from the deposit banks. Uh, but, but what they don't realize is a lot of times people just want payment banks. They, 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 don't, they don't want to necessarily tie up their money into lending to some, you know, some, something that they have no control of. So, so we always have this problem of moral hazard. We always have this problem of, of liquidity versus solvency. We need liquidity so we can keep you know, trading and, and keep commerce going. Um, but then if you have a credit cycle, you lose, you lose it, and then you have to, you have to bail people out. So, so yeah, I mean, with, with our system, back to the original point, we don't have any of those issues. It's, it's just gold. It's just a piece of metal that, that holds value, and it's yours. You can send the title to anyone anywhere uh, without any problems if there's a credit cycle or anything else. And you can actually, you have debit cards now. I, saw, I want to order one <laughs> later tonight. Got, uh, got... Here, use this one. Yeah. I, Hello. Here, I have, a, I have a mic here too. I yeah, we'll, work, uh, we'll share and we'll share. Okay. That's working. Does it work now? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've got uh, a lot of debit cards now in, in the wild. Um, you know, MasterCard is saying actually they were uh, you know, one of the faster issuers they've seen um, wow. on a global basis because we have, we have cards now in 150 countries. Who can... Thank you. That's making me more generous than MasterCard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> Thanks on me. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Who needs an ATM when you can go to a pawn shop? <laughs> Actually, I have a good idea. Let's do a little uh, Dragon's Den or a startup sort of web summit thing. This shirt, I thought, you know, this would make a great product to sell, like little pieces of gold. You get a gram, a gram of gold, you can just pay for anything. It would be much heavier if it was real. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if it would still qualify for dress code. <laughs> so, so, so you, you got, you know, uh, Roy, earlier, you know, you spoke uh, quite passionately about the history of gold and, and um, so, and you guys, you know, you're a startup basically, still, I mean, it's fair to say, and you're here in Toronto, and you're expanding pretty rapidly, I think the head counts up to in the 30s now, and think things are moving pretty rapidly. But, so, I, I wanted to ask you as, I mean, your focus is, um, is such that, uh, did, did you, do you need to kind of put yourself in that frame of mind where you are, because the hardest thing to do in a startup is to stay focused, I think. And it's, it, Stay really in, in the moment there. Do you, is that where your focus comes from, that idea that you are tapping into an historical reality that, that, is, that is being brought you know, into the 21st century? It sounds like versus just plain numbers. I don't, you don't sound like a guy who's just like, numbers, numbers, numbers. You, there's something deeper going on oh, here. Is that yeah. a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, we're very mission driven, we're very passionate. When we started this business, um, we never thought in our wildest dreams that it would grow this fast or we'd raise this much capital. We, we put millions of dollars of our own money in first and we, uh, and we just thought it was going to be this kind of very niche business with maybe a few thousand clients. Um, and, and I agree with you. I, I, I think our job, we see it as our job to liberate gold. Gold has been shackled, you know, pun intended. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's shackled. And so, you know, we, we see two, two problems. One is people no longer have choice in money. And, and that social contract has been broken between um, between your government and and you know as 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 generally a great thing, uh, and and the government in actually being the issuer of money, uh, and and so long as there was an interest rate, uh, I found it difficult to uh, debate this philosophically. Um, but ever since interest rates have hit zero now, almost eight years. Um, I think that you know our kids are going to look back at this generation, and, you know, with, with with government issued currency the way we look back at like Sony Walkman. Um, you know, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. So we see it uh, as our job to offer choice and money and to liberate gold because we think that's the best money. And so so far we've liberated it for in terms of how I, I, I focus myself. Um, we've we've liberated gold for savings. It's it's the easiest way to save gold. Uh, in the world, you open an account in minutes, you make a deposit with a credit card, um, and, and then you can use it in transfers. You can make payments with it, and you can spend it in the economy. It's interoperable with the economy today. You're not skating to where the buck's headed. You're actually spending gold today. And, and if you think closely, um, there are a lot of other uh, verticals that we can get into just following that mantra of liberate, liberating gold. Uh, and so you should be able to do Everything. The, the truth is that the motivation for doing more generally comes from these interactions. 
you know, we'll travel around the world, we'll meet our, our users, and our users will say, you know, why can't I get a mortgage from you? Why can't I get a credit card from you? Why don't I get airline miles? Why can't I, you know, and, and, and these ideas then come in, and we say, okay, would people actually, you know, are developing this, this customer relation with us to the point where they want to do more, you know, why don't you have a branch? Why don't you, so, so I think it's, you know, I would be lying if I would say there was a master plan here. You know, there, there isn't. It's, it's really about tapping into this thing that made gold so successful for so many years. And, and I think that really is, is, is what's moving the whole thing. Let me, let me ask Josh. So Josh, um, I, I, I think I get the impression that you're out there meeting, um, taking, taking high level meetings, I guess you could say. Uh, we know that in the hedge fund industry now you've got like this George Soros's are, are into gold and things. And, and so you, you've got the, 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 the bit gold story, the gold money story. And what's, what's been the reaction out there? Do you see, like, uh, are attitudes changing? Or how is the story being accepted out there? And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, the timing's perfect because I, I actually just flew in from a Wall Street uh, FinTech conference, you know, uh, uh, funds, other, other uh, you know, household money companies. And I was on a panel. Um, and I didn't have to talk about gold's history or anything else. I just had to say, like, we're, we're on this panel about transfers and payments. Uh, we have the Swiss uh, uh, yield curve now negative out to 30 years. Uh, you know, so so, so there, there's just no way to get a positive interest rate. So how do you actually run payments in a negative interest rate environment? How do you, how do you cross borders? Who carries who carries the uh, the cost of, of, of holding the payment in yeah. the, the payment and transit issue? So I just bring up. I don't even have to talk about gold. I just talk about the, the, the problems of, of asking how is their system actually going to work in this environment. And then gold actually kept being the solution that they came back to. So, yeah. so I, I didn't have to promote my business. I just talked about their problems. Well, so I, I noticed, I think you guys came in number one in a recent poll in a fintech. Um, really? Yeah. I, I don't know about it that. Was that. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and number one was Bitcoin. Wow. Okay. I, have, I, have I, I want to say something yeah. on negative interest rates. I, I think a good way to understand negative interest rates for you all is what they're doing is this is like tribute. I mean, this goes mm. back to like this is a, this goes against the Magna Carta. Like they are your savings after you worked hard in their system and you've earned your savings. They're deleting a portion of it every year. This is a papal indulgence. It's, it's it's unacceptable. You get to heaven. You have to get the you know bishop a few quid. It's true. <laughs> it's, 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 it's essentially. Are you familiar yeah. with this? <laughs> but, but, but it's and then a, the Reformation. Give me nothing. I can talk to God, right? Right to God. That's it. I'm not giving you nothing. That was the modern Christianity. No, but it goes back to being a slave. It goes back to being a slave. And when when title to land would shift, so so too would the title to the people that live on the slaves. And and I think that I know you don't like that I'm going here, but but uh, but I was good before you came. I didn't get that point, uh, so. But, but really, like, Roy took us on a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, Odyssey, Bhutan, Space. We all did mushrooms. <laughs> Talk about Gordy Howe. Space. You missed the whole thing about Gordy Howe. I did a dance. Well, I was thinking, actually, who was the other. Beautiful. Who was the other goalie you were talking about that got Jack hit? Jack Plant. Oh, go he, Porsley. So, so he's the Volker of goalies. He's the. Uh, he's Volker. Yes. He took yes. it all. <laughs> no, no, but just one last yeah. point on this. Like, the way I look at it is. The, the lands, there's 190 countries, those are the lands, and because you're forced to live somewhere, you can't go live on, at sea. And, and with negative interest rates, you know, we're all the slaves to the people that are running the government, they're the slave masters, and we have to live on the land. So if we move to another land, there's negative interest rates there too, and it, and it literally is something that uh, I, I hope, you know, where do we get the passion from? Here's a question for you. Um, isn't this give people some immunity against gold confiscation, which we saw in the 30s? To some degree, can you comment on that? Yeah, so we built our platform such that you could uh, move the gold in between different jurisdictions. And uh, if, you, if you know your history, as Max alluded to, uh, there have been several gold confiscations. They didn't call them that. But they would basically say, you have until this date to bring all your gold in. Don't worry, we'll give you the official rate. If gold is 2065, you bring your gold, we'll give you 2065. And then at some arbitrary date, once they got all the gold they wanted, they changed the rate from 2065 to $35. So they basically devalued your money by 50%. And, and, and that's if you just 
to that moment. So with our system, you can move the gold around different jurisdictions. You know, Switzerland has never confiscated gold. The UK has never confiscated gold. Um, and so, you know, you have that option. But, but I will add one point that's very different today, in today's day and age. At that time, gold backed all money. So it was actually part of their system. At this point, it's separate. So, so now gold is like confiscating a house. Uh, it, it's not part of their monetary system. So, so I, I, I don't think we live in that same age, just you know, socially and being able to do that. Well, there's another system. reason too. I think that, that if we build a movement the way we're doing here, uh, it becomes very difficult to, uh, for the government to do that. And you know, one of the things we're gonna be working on this year, uh, and we'd like all your help with is, we're going to be lobbying uh, the Canadian government to remove the capital gains tax on gold. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> help and, and, and we have to do this because this can be great for Canada too so just two seconds on this um, when you when you earn your gold say I pay my employees in gold so so Emily over there will get her salary in gold so let's say just, let's say she makes a thousand dollars a month she, she makes more than that but let's just say that's what she makes. <laughs> well so so if, if she gets gold weight at, at that first of the month um, she would still pay income tax to the Canadian government by simply remitting 35% of that weight of gold to the government at that day Right? But then whatever she had left, the 65% in weight of gold, from that moment on, she could spend it in the economy, and there wouldn't be these little capital gains. Now say she buys something from Darren, right? and, 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 she, and Darren receives the gold. Well, he would still pay income tax at that rate. If the gold appreciated from the time she bought it by 2x, Darren would still pay 35 So the government doesn't really lose a lot of revenue here. And the rule would be, the way we're thinking of structuring this, is it would have to be for gold stored in Canada. And with our ledger, and think about what that does, it, it creates capital inflows into Canada, you know, it, it increases the velocity of gold, gold rises, it's good for everyone, how could they go against that? So we're gonna be working on that this year and we'd like your help with it. Is, is the government of Canada pretty favorable? Are they at ease to reach? How, how's the environment here? Well, they just sold us their gold. We, we actually. Uh, are you? Did you buy it? We we actually put a bid on it. We wanted to uh, buy the last form oh, of uh, Canadian gold. But it's, it's, it didn't you work know, out Max and I on Kaiser Report and our various stuff we've made for other networks. Um, you know, we've we've met a lot of gold companies, gold people, all sorts of stuff for you know 15 years, and. Uh, before we've met you, like it's mostly been older people, more of the Swiss banking model, more very conservative. And how has uh, Bitcoin, the new arrival on the scene in the monetary scene, um, when we first covered this as well, we were the first uh, global news network to cover it, when it was like $2. And I have to tell you, we got so much hate from gold bugs, they were like, yeah, I'm hating this. Don't talk about Bitcoin. And then it went up to like 200, 300, 400, and they're like, what's this Bitcoin thing about? And uh, how has that sort of ethos, though, uh, you know, inspired you in terms of coming up with the, the ideas from there uh, must have translated into of your course, platform? Yeah. We'd be lying if we'd say no. I remember hearing about Bitcoin in 2010. Uh, I was at a party somewhere, some hipster party, and someone told me about it. And it was like $6 at the time. But, but the truth is that Josh and I had the idea for a gold-backed bank, as we called it. Um, you know, I had the idea kind of going back to 07, 08, when I was trying to protect my own hedge fund. And I wondered why there wasn't one gold-backed financial institution. I thought it was a very compelling business model. You know, there's 30,000 banks, they're all crap. There's one bank that has gold backing. You know, why, who wouldn't want an account at that bank? Um, but what happened with Bitcoin is it inspired us to think bigger. We realized there was more of a consumer product here, and we realized that instead of being a kind of marble columned private bank, we should be a platform that was a software as a service that could be delivered to millions of people, kind of like PayPal. So that's kind of why we, we called it that way. Yeah, and I, I think um, we, we also got very inspired. The, the technology is amazing. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I won't say that at all. But, but what we got inspired by, as much as the network, is the use cases. You know, everything they talked about. It was, it was, the use cases worked because it was commodity money. It wasn't because it was Bitcoin or Ethereum or gold or silver. It was commodity money uh, that had sort of its own value in, in, in its, being, being, its uh, being what it was. And so, so uh, you know, a lot of the things that, they, that, that Bitcoin talks about, even still in theory, it's not interoperable with the bank. It's, it kind of lives separate from the banking system because the banks don't like to, to, to make it interoperable. But our system, uh, although the use cases can be identical, 
the, the, we are ex actually the exact opposite in Bitcoin in that instead of being purely digital, we're purely physical. Yeah. Instead of being purely anonymous, we have to know uh, who our customer is because we're you know, vaulting your gold for you. So, it's, so, so we're, th that makes us uh, actually interoperable with the banking system and, and know your customer laws and, and anti-money laundering, but we don't have to have their, their central bank stack, uh, but we can still work in and out of it. Bitcoin is amazing though. I, I will say that uh, you know, the more time that passes, the more I have time to think about Bitcoin, the more I, I realize that uh, you know, Bitcoin may end up may end up beg, making the power structure beg for a gold standard. Mm. In, in other words, they, they can't control it. And uh, at least with gold, they can control it with weapons, and they can you know, scare us, and they can store it, and they can confiscate it. It's physical. They can it's physical. It. But, but I could kind of, I had a dream the other day that all this you know, stuff that Josh and I are coming up with, all these pithy, like, you know, some politician runs for office, starts using it, and just says, you know, because the second citizens demand Bitcoin, uh, then the governments are in a serious problem because they can't shut it down, it's like file sharing. It's anti-fragile, whereas with gold, there's still kind of this element of governance and, and it's physical, and so, yeah, I see Bitcoin That's running. Right. They're saying that the governments would be scared into gold yeah, as a devil. response to this Bitcoin threat. Yeah, the devil they know, right? right. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's pretty it, interesting. Because a, a world under crypto is, is a world where the government has absolutely the economist, the government, the businessman. It's it's truly um, you know a, a, a real money. I mean, it's, in terms of like mo unmanipulatable money, uh, and I think that that is uh, is is something they'll never go for. Here's a, I just thought of this question. I sent you guys are gold experts. I'm curious what you think about it. There was this idea floated around a while ago of peak gold, that that the uh, the actual amount of gold that's available to be mined in the world is coming to. Uh, Kind of, kind of a close. If the, the mines in South Africa, I think they're getting into lava. You know, they're so deep. They're, <laughs> you know, there's, getting, there's only so much. What's the latest on that? Is that is that a thing? Is that happening? What, what's the latest? He's a mining engineer. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is this is actually very important to understand why gold has has value in the first place. Um, we we been sort of tricked to believe that, that gold is a commodity and has these short-term supply and demand fluctuations like copper or grains or, or something else. And in fact, every Wall Street analyst, you know, analyzes gold like they analyze the oil market. They talk about the supply this year and the disruptions and, and all of this. But the, the thing is, gold is a money stock. It's not, it's not a flow. It's not a flow commodity that gets consumed. All of the gold that's ever been produced is, still exists. So that, that incremental supply... I think I have to explain that. I think that's a big one. Most people yeah. explain, like, it, the, the gold is the only thing, because of the physics that I explained earlier, like oil evaporates, you use it, it combusts, copper oxidizes, so you kind of need to produce these things every year. With gold, you don't need to. It's, yeah, you actually don't need to produce gold at all. Um, and, and you still have that entire stock that can be valued relative to your currency. So, yeah. so the, the, the stock of currency it fluctuates uh, with the stock of gold. It doesn't need that short-term supply and demand. The short-term supply and demand is the price discovery. Just like mining Bitcoin is, is, is the proof of work. Uh, mining gold is the proof of value. It's a proof of energy. Um, and so, so now they're talking about, well, you know, what if we fly to, the, you know, you know, fly to asteroids and mine, mine gold and bring it back? We don't need to. We have plenty of gold. We know where the gold is. It's just a function of energy. If energy gets really cheap, we'll get more gold. Uh, and the gold price will come down. But the price of everything else will come down. But, but the, the Earth's crust is, is yeah, so it's, I'll, not, I'll, it's, not, it's a finite supply, right? I mean, no, are we so getting close to the boundary there? That's my no, question. No, so the way to look at it is um, there's this crustal abundance of gold, right? And then there, there are ore bodies, which is a concentration of gold that's economic. And, and an ore body will generally have a grade and a tonnage, i.e., uh, what, what percentage of this ore body can be mined at a certain grade, grade and tonnage. So, so if you take a ton of rock, how many grams of gold will be in there? Now, the, the peak gold thesis or hypothesis is based on this, this view that when you look at the gold reserves today that have been delineated by mining companies um, and you extrapolate, say, the mine life. I, I wrote a whole, a whole report about this a few years ago. Um, you could see that in 20 years, uh, there's no more reserves. But, but what Josh is saying is the grade can keep declining. In other words, in, in 10,000 years, if we have fusion, we could mine 0. 0.000005 grams of gold. Um, so so we, we don't think that thinking about people is instructive for understanding the gold market. 
We, we think that what's more instructive is to look at the market cap of all the gold, the way Josh says, the, the stock of gold. And today I think it's about $10 trillion. And to say uh, that you know, the value of that $10 trillion bucket in relation to everything else, so all the world's real estate, all the world's currencies, all the world's stocks, all the world's bonds, all the world's you know, tangible antiques, everything, it's, it's around $300 trillion. And so you've got kind of this, this one, it's like an inverted pyramid, where the point of the pyramid is $10 trillion, and it's kind of barely balancing itself out. Uh, and, and then as the pyramid layers uh, erupt kind of from that point, it's all these other asset classes. And so um, I think what's more int instructive is to say, what was the historical ratio of the point of the pyramid, the, 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 the stock of gold, to everything else? And, and it, it was never 100%. We've always had credit, we've, we've always had IOUs, um, but, but it, it's actually closer to 10% if you, if you go back through history. Um, and so at 10%, um, you know, the, the gold price should basically be uh, at around three times where it is here. And, and, and that doesn't mean that that's going to happen, it could overshoot, it could go under, but, but that kind of is the way James Turk likes to say that's the fair uh, monetary value of gold today. Um, well, a couple of points you know, they touched on, which I think are pretty good points. So, a lot of people are obsessed with the gold price in dollars and the price action in dollars. And you mentioned James Turk, he was all his great research there. He had a, couple, he had a chart which shows the 15 year track record of gold in the 12 or 13 top traded currencies. And in the average, uh, in, against this entire grid, you're still in the 7, 8, 9, 10% per annum gain against all these currencies. If you just look at dollars, it's a warped view. If you look at the entire fiat currency grid, you see that except for 2014, which was a, a one year bad at 15, you've got an annual percentage gains that are fantastic. You know? but, but that also ties with your notion about energy, because the US dollar is basically oil. It's like it's, it's, yeah, it's we're, oil. we're getting a little technical here. I, I agree with you, I, but that's a great point, because in that analysis that I made, it was flawed, because the world doesn't have $300 trillion of assets. It's not, they're not all denominated in US dollars. Mm. It's, it's 7 billion people that are uh, uh, you know, conducting you know, their day and, and, and doing things every day and measuring things in, in their local, localized value. And so uh, what's more interesting in, in the point Max has made is that um, another interesting way to look at these kind of 195 different currencies is, is they're in this rigged race. Uh, you know, think of it like a horse race. And, uh, and, and what happens is, you know, for the viewer, if you're watching the race, it always seems like one of the currencies is stronger than the other. But, but really, it's always a race to zero. They all end up at zero. And, and, it's, and, what, and I'll, I'll prove this to you, uh, you know, with the following um, thought experiment. So if you were to take the US dollar euro ratio today, it's 1.11, okay? Now, if you were to go back 12 years, if I were to freeze you in time 12 years ago, uh, it was also 112. And so I, I froze you 12 years ago. You, you check you know, the stock screen, it's 112. You wake up today, it's 112. And I would just start asking you questions. Hey, uh, do you think anything's changed in, in the world? You'd say, well, the euro is 112, it was 112. I guess nothing's changed. You go to the supermarket, price of steak, three times higher. You go to buy a, a flat, a, you know, property. Property's three times higher. You go to pay for tuition in school, three, four times higher. Uh, healthcare, three, four times higher. Say, well, well, what the hell? I thought these currencies were supposed to measure their success against each other. Uh, the truth is, no. It, you know, once they delinked gold as the baseline, what you keep seeing is a currency versus another currency. But they're all at the, in this race towards zero. So, um, you, you have a great point, so you brought up, uh, you know, everything, you know, they, they say there's no inflation, there's no inflation. You know, anything that it means to be middle class, you know, education, healthcare, you know, quality food, <laughs> all of these things are compounding at five, six percent a year in, in all currencies. Um, and, and there's always this, this adjustment, but everything that it means to be middle class, and, and Roy made a good point, in, in this environment, you have to have the returns of Warren Buffett, you know, outperforming the market by five percent, just to keep up the price with basic, you know, middle class goods. That's why he eats all this thing, he's the only one that can eat it. He's the only <laughs> one making that, you know, producing alpha. But there's another uh, interesting numbers that in this discussion that come up that are interesting. So, just to give folks an overview, which is kind of, kind of interesting. So, the, you alluded to it a little earlier. 
all the gold that's ever been mined, something like 170,000 tons. And then the breakdown of where that is. Central banks, who owns what. And, and, and I'm just... Are we still using the analogy where if you put all the gold that's ever been mined into one place, it would be two Olympic swimming pools or a 40 or one cubic tennis court or what? What, what are we using? Yeah, it, it was uh, underneath the Eiffel Tower or something. Okay. That, that was the last bull market. You know, every mining company, it, what do they say about a mine? It's a liar standing next to a hole. Uh, so, so that was uh, you know, <laughs> with modern day technology, it's just a PowerPoint. They don't even have to dig the hole anymore. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I remember you know coming here from the you know the U.S. when I was in my hedge fund, like oh look at all these. TSX Venture companies. But it's not a lot of gold. You can put it in like this, this room, essentially, this would be all the gold that's ever been mined in this case. Yeah, something like that. It's yeah. a cube roughly the size of this, of this auditorium. That's, yeah. it. that's it? That's all there is? That's all there it, is. It's, on, it's, it's worth $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Dollars, it's 170,000 tons. And how many tons are in central bank hands? So 30,000 tons are held in central bank form, bullion, the same stuff that you all own. So we're, we're playing on that level. Um, then you've got 70,000 tons, I believe, that's held in jewelry form. In other words, it's being adorned. And, and a good way to think about jewelry, every time someone says jewelry to you, uh, think wallet. Jewelry is a wallet. People, you know, the majority of people, rich people in the West, they actually don't even like gold jewelry anymore. But the majority of people that have jewelry around the world, this is their wallet. Gold didn't become jewelry because it's shiny. Jewelry, you know, jewelry became gold because it allowed people to carry gold. You know, that, that's why people have jewelry. Um, and so there's, there's 70,000 tons that's probably owned by a few billion people in a very distributed web. Uh, and then I think 20,000 tons uh, is, is owned by industry. That, that's another thing, you know, gold has no value. Actually, you know, Josh can tell you about gold's value as, as a mining engineer, but it actually has a tremendous amount of value. It's the single best conductor of energy that we have. That's why every pin on every semiconductor has to be gold. It can't be copper because it'll oxidize. And there's nothing better than copper to, to um, uh, uh, transmit energy and, and over time because of the oxidation, because of oxygen. So in every one of your phones, there's about a dollar worth of gold. And so the, the, the um, anti kind of gold crowd likes to say it has no utility, but the truth is we as humans decided to ascribe more value to it as money than as a pure commodity that we just install. The price of gold dropped to $300 tomorrow. In two seconds flat, companies would buy it just, just, to, just to use it in industry. Um, at that point, it would be competitive. Right, right. Okay, fair enough. And w w how about uh, central banks, though? Do you look at that? Do you, does that matter to the market in terms of, um, I, I know the IMF just reported that uh, China and Russia alone have bought 85% of all the gold supply available for sale. And, and they're, they're the only central banks buying in the past. I, I try not to look at any of that stuff. But the only thing that I look at is how many users have joined my platform. And how much gold do you all own? So the fact yeah. that we're looking after you know, two billion dollars now, it's like 1.8 today, um, you know, boggles my mind. Because I went on Wikipedia the other day, and there was, you know, this World Gold Reserves page, and in the World Gold Reserves page, like, we're there, we own 42, you own 42 tons of gold, you own more than many countries. Wow. And, and so, yeah, that's amazing. And so, I, I think, like, that's the only thing that matters, you know, we, we just have to get more people to do it, because uh, I, I truly believe that uh, that the way that Max said, they're, they're all setting up. There's no doubt that there's a game theory going on with all these countries uh, where, um, you know, kind of, I remember, I remember when China, they were, they were talking, oh, we may include them in the SDR, we may not include them in the SDR. All of a sudden, China put up a huge gold print, and the next day, Lagarde's like, you're in the SDR. You right. know? And, 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 and it was like almost this game of chicken with the IMF, like, if you don't put us in the SDR, we will buy gold. And so I, I think it goes back to that whole Rickards theory and, and, and the currency wars, but your job is to actually own as much gold as you can afford. Don't speculate on it. Don't leverage yourself to own gold. But, you know, I, for the last two years, I've been telling everyone 10%, 10%. And I've secretly had around 20%. And, and, and I think that it really should be 20% given the fact that they're not raising interest rates. Well, let me ask you this. Like now, this is a Canadian loony. Um, first of all, am I, am I crazy or is this plastic? Is this plastic? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's not even paper anymore. You know, okay, they're making and, fun and, of me. And check this out. You can see it's right through it. It's, it's, are they laughing at us? It's, it's, they're laughing. It's like they're just a cosmic joke. Pretty soon it'll just have nothing on it. just be a clear piece of paper. And it's plastic. It's a saran wrap. You're going to pull a whip 
got saran wrap in your pocket, they'll be like, should have bought gold. <laughs> should have thought the royal big gold. That's nothing but saran wrap, buddy. <laughs> what, what is this? This is this, this is not good. Who is this fellow? He doesn't play hockey. He's a goalie. Well, Max, you have ripped up so many paper dollars. You can't rip up the plastic. I know. <laughs> 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 Who are these fellows? I'm getting uncomfortable. <laughs> He looks like a very intelligent man. <laughs> Who was on the five loony note? Wilfred Laurier. Who? Wilfred Laurier. 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 You said five different things. <laughs> All right, well, I learn something every day. I'll work with the Wikipedia. But that's really the thing. If, if I could arm you with one kind of message when you go home, um, and obviously, as we always do, please help us share this and grow this. It's only for your benefit. It's for all of our benefits. But we, we really are creating a movement. But I would argue with this thing. Next time you're sitting with someone, uh, just say to them, you know, have you ever thought why you're working, you know, uh, five hours more for a piece of plastic that says 100 versus a piece of pl a plastic that says 20? All right, let me ask a couple of quick, quick things here. So here's a quote. You get your reaction to it. First, Josh. Uh, and then right. So Warren Buffett said, quote, there's class war going, there's class war, all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war, and we're winning. We had that quote from Warren. Yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is the reason we started this business. Um, money no longer has to be earned, it can be accessed. You don't have to earn it from your customers. So you just, you know, you get credit and then you mine your customers. That, that's the structure of our economy. You don't have to pay your workers for a division of labor if you can get infinite credit from an infinite you know, cash machine. Uh, so we've changed the whole power structure of, 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 of a division of labor and serving each other in cooperation. That's why they don't call it deflation, because they don't think those wages haven't gone anywhere. Yeah, they'll never let wages. I mean, think right. about we, we fix people's salaries over the course of a year. In a year, you know, my assets and my securities portfolio could double. You know, by the time I, I, I sell some securities to pay for the wages that I, for my employees, uh, you know, th th there, there's different purchasing power decay paradigm. Yeah, here's, here's, I'll get your reaction to this. So this is uh, a guy talking about in Lloyd's. He worked at a bank in Lloyd's. He said the pressure to, uh, to sell was so great that uh, in one case, an advisor missold insurance to himself, <laughs> his wife, and a colleague to make the quota, needing to missell a certain volume of fake insurance each month to keep his job. You know, I think, you know, Charlie Munger says it best, you know, always measure someone's incentive. Okay, how about this one? Lessons for the brain damaged investor. This is the Wall Street Journal, 2005. The UK investment banker, and one major investment bank in which I worked, we used psychometric testing to recruit psychopaths <laughs> because their, their characteristics exactly suited them to senior corporate finance roles. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts? American psycho. American psycho. Uh, given my uh, resume, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's here, talk about the manipulation of, 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 of numbers, right? Uh, in Britain, the Office of National Statistics, they needed to boost GDP. So they added the $10 billion of GDP by adding heroin users and prostitutes. So according to the Office of National Statistics, each of the UK's 60,879 prostitutes took home 25 clients a week at an average price of 67 and 16p per pop. 38,000 heroin users at sales of 754 million pounds or $37 a gram. So this is just, I mean, they're just, it's not but, loaded. What's going on but here? This goes back to the, to the whole economics discipline where there's no more rigor. So, you know, even someone like Kane, say what you say, he wrote a book, you know, The General Theory of Employment. He's, he's written many books. The economists today, the academics today, they, they write one-page blog posts and they, and they consider that to be a theory. I'd like to know who the hell has articulated the NERP, ZERP, uh, Ooh, Huey theory. That's a good point. I, I'd like to know where was it peer reviewed, where who published it, and and who's done the econometrics on it. And but that's what we said at the top. It's a freak it, show. It's a freak yeah, show. Yeah. What is GDP? It's a useless metric. The the only metric I think that matters is is the wealth inequality metric and the global financial asset values. You okay, know? fair enough. Here to get your reaction to this, but I think we have some time here. Uh, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder quote: Some banks are so large it's difficult for us to prosecute them. So, Senate committee, we are concerned that the mentality of the too big to jail for banks will spread from financial fraud cases to terrorist financing and money laundering 
holder. The size of these institutions is so large that it does become difficult for us to prosecute them. That they're saying these banks are above the law? Yeah. No comment? I mean, it says it's coming. No, I, mean, no, I, I think they've become utilities, though, in this last cycle. They're, they're definitely, you know, it, I almost think that the kind of first shot at the armor of the banks was the Occupy Wall Street culturally, and then all these fines. I remember having, because I invested in a lot of bank stocks during all the fines, like Bank of America. But now you have, like, this fintech upheaval that I think if it wasn't for that first shot across the bow, we wouldn't be able to disrupt a bank. In other words, they would have been so powerful, they would have stomped us. And so I, I actually think that, you know, say what you say, that there, there was a good result to all that activism, I think. And, and, and there were some pretty hefty fines. Leaving. No one went to jail, that's true. Right. Um, okay, finally. Um, do, the, do the sandwich. Yeah. What? Do the sandwich one. Now the sandwich one? I didn't have my sandwich one. Uh, the cheapest sandwich. But uh, this says, the FT was saying that the, the fear of numbers has left many Britons unable to assess the arguments of politicians and officials due to financial and economic illiteracy. Mm. They suffer from numeracy deficit. So now you guys are on a, a push to, I mean, they're blaming people, the victims, essentially, for being too stupid to understand how the banks ripped them off. But you guys... Uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you, by the way, I think you're doing a branch type of thing? Yeah, yeah we're opening a branch. There's a whole library there, and so this is, a, this is part of the effort, correct? Well, you know, they say that uh, you know when an economist has a sense of humor when they use decimals. Uh, because, because, because uh, you know, they, they sit there, and they project stuff, and they sit at the beginning of the year, and they're never right. And then, like, the audacity to put a decimal. You know, it's like, it's like just try to, try to be in the zip code, the right postal code. Um, but yeah, I think measuring things in weights of gold uh, will empower you. Um, and you know, we actually can see how many of our users, what currency they're using to see their account. And one of the trends that I've been noticing is more and more users are using the gram, the gold gram. In other words, they just see their account, not in fiat terms anymore. It doesn't seem to go up and down. It's purely in gold weight. And, and I think that that is the solution. If you want to know what the solution is, that's the solution. That's the revolution. Yeah. I mean, a stable measurement system is, is, is so key. I mean, the, uh, a dollar is always a dollar, but it doesn't mean the same thing. And, and, and not enough people understand that. So you see prices, it'll be like, this is ten, four grand. Correct. That's the price. Well, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. We're working on something, I think, that will really, really... Uh, but people start thinking in, in yeah, grants. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the price, that's the value. This is a simple trick. This is, this is the old gold scale, you know, gold standard. Uh, if you just measure things in gold, I mean, whether it's the stock market or food, you can see over a long enough period of time, if you look at it, if it's underperforming gold, it's generally something that's not good for you and, 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 and not, uh, not actually productive. If, if it's outperforming gold, like gold's not the best thing. You're like you want to take risk, you want to build cooperation, you want to you know you want to invest in entrepreneurs, that sort of thing. Uh, but the gold's just a measuring stick. So so the companies, there's very few companies that actually outperform gold. Uh, there's an index, but an index is a it's only about 20% of the companies, and and that's over just a 20-year period. If you if you stretch the time scale going back, you know the Dow. People hear about the Dow. Buffett likes to say. To Becky Quick on CNBC, you could have bought the Dow at the turn of the century at 100. Mm. Now it's 17,000, yeah. and gold was 20 dollars, and it's a thousand. So we're like, look, you know, the Dow outperformed gold. Well, that original Dow had 30 components, 29 of which are wallpaper. But that sort of information would be in the <laughs> they don't exist. Standard rope and twine. You know, this was a this was a big company. Standard rope and twine. You know, the turn of the century was yeah. a, was a huge. Uh, uh, you know, so so that's and and no one tells you this. No one intelligent is sitting there and saying. Uh, Mr. Buffett, you're wrong. Well, that would be an interesting metric to provide to users of the site. Is that sort of like what are those 20 companies that outperform gold? Like to see charts like that. Yeah, and, I mean, and it's also like all food prices are going up, but then you have bad food going up, mm. and you have good food going up. Put gold right in the middle. Like, like the bad food is not underperforming gold. Ah. Yeah, GMO food shrinkflation. Yeah, that's interesting. He's done work on this. It's yeah. pretty and, interesting. And, and we've got, uh, you know, GMO money. Uh, like gold. <laughs> like we were on a conference panel the other day where we had, uh, it, was, it was us, a former central banker that was explaining the fiat system, and a blockchain expert. They went first, and then you know, Roy went up and said, okay, now you've heard the genetically modified money. Uh, now, let's, now let's talk about whole money. That's a good way to put it, because if you look at the U.S., for example, all that corn, you know, how they made it productive, 
was just to remove all the proteins, yeah. the nutrients that you need. And so this is the same what they've done with it, currency. It, it, it's like it, we want a currency exactly. that you can build more, do more. It's stuff. slavery. You yeah. know, it's, we pay our tribute and we're fed crap food and we increase our crop yields. Like my favorite thing is when these guys, you know, that are, that are cheerleading will say, look at how we've increased our crop yields. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we basically have destroyed the nutrients. Exactly. You know, like it used to be Nobody like you could, feed, yeah, you could feed 100 people on an acre of land. Now, you know, Buffett will say you could feed 6,000 people on an acre. It's, you're, you're not feeding them, you're causing cancer. Like, and what we want to do is, is, I mean, obviously this is, this is interesting from a high level, but we really want to prove it. We want to prove that good money actually would have been investing into better technology. When you, when you have bad money, you have, you have less rigor. Uh, when, when you invest all of this time in something uh, for a certain return and, and wage, and, and that wage you know, just doesn't hold value, it's like, it's like using banana money. Like, like, don't you want to use money to last and, and invest the time in something to earn good money? Well, a good way to think about this is money is also a price signal. And, and, and there is embedded information in the money that's extremely valuable to market participants, <laughs> entrepreneurs, and, and when the price signal itself can be manipulated from kind of one central command mothership, then it causes all of us to spend time doing, doing exercises of utility, doing things that don't really matter. Well, we talk about that on our show all the time, price propaganda. Yeah. So price precedes news, and if you can control the price, you can control the news. Because it get reactions from people to react to prices, and then that creates a news cycle. And so that, that's what we try to combat by coming up with the, a broader look at things to, so people understand and where they are in that equation of price and news so that they can understand that they're either being manipulated or not being manipulated. But, they're, but, but when, when you see folks talk about these prices out there, they are, in, they are trying to control the news cycle as well because these two things have become fused because the stock market has become entertaining. You know, I, I know, but anyway, we're running kind of, I, 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 this I is good quickly, actually. I want to quickly wrap up on something too, is like the, the notion of uh, gold th- that you always see on CNBC is that people hoard it and it doesn't circulate. What, what do you have to say about that? Okay, so today, gold had its best day ever. And we had our largest redemption day ever. And this has been true. We've actually, we have, we've been wanting to keep this under wraps, but we are proving, you know, empirically that days when gold goes up, people don't buy the gold, they spend the gold. And, and, and it's pretty amazing to see that because it goes counter to the whole Gresham's Law theory and all these theories before you know, the internet and copper wires and stuff. But like, there's, there's that. One last thing I just want to say, the, the other uh, good thing to use with your friends and, and family to help them understand this is go to the supermarket and start writing down the prices of even like one or two items so you have like some type of a, uh, an archive. You know, because you, know, you see stock prices go up and down. Your supermarket's more volatile than the stock market. You just don't remember. The human mind doesn't like to remember a lot of prices. And the second thing you should do is measure the weight of the stuff in, in the, so take a bag of M&Ms. You know, you, what you'll notice is that the price will rise, but the amount of M&Ms, count them, will actually decline, shrinkflation. And, and, and this is empirical, like, you know, you can see this, it's been happening for the last 40 years, and it's because these companies have to cheat just a little bit. Just a little yeah, bit. actually, right. Uh, the riders explicitly says for our appearance here, we would be having only blue M and M's <laughs> backstage, and there was multicolored M and M's. Well, we're well, yeah. sorry. One last point: you say we're out of time because I want to be very careful about all of this. They, they. I, I really don't believe there's a they. I think there's just there's just, there's there's a theory that kind of did, is, became an echo chamber. That somehow if we had bad money, we'd all just work harder and have a better economy. Mm-hmm. And, and we just want choice. Maybe we're all wrong up here. Maybe we're all wrong. Um, but I think that people would want better money. Uh, I, I think. Um, but, but, but there's no they. It's, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's a theory that has a monopoly and we need choice. Um, and maybe we're all wrong. Well, in, the, in that, the U.S. you can definitely... You, you can definitely see it in the U.S. Any of the data, any of the charts, any of the real uh, income... You can see it all. Every the the ordinary person became so worse off post seventy one. For sure. So it, it, I agree. It's all in the yeah. math. Like, yeah. you, you, my favorite episode of yours was was your Christmas special with Russell Brand. You were talking about that, that exact point. Yeah. And, uh, and and and, and but, but people don't understand this. It's not even out there. Like I think there's probably like it's because of all the press propaganda. But it goes back to I think this can be used. This wisdom can be used as propaganda for an up and coming politician that we all vote for. Yeah. In other words. You know, like, it, it, the wisdom has been lost now to the point where even the power structure has forgotten the wisdom. 
You know, maybe there are a few people left in the treasury, the ones that are that sold gold today. But you end up in a dark age. And it, but, <laughs> but it's not they necessarily that, that you're saying, oh, we need like, uh, say, a Ron Paul solution of like a gold standard being imposed on the people. But well, you could say, I want to be paid in gold. Tax <laughs> so I don't want you well, to pay. Exactly. Or like you can convert your your income to gold. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, well, we've been up here about an hour and a half, so I think we yeah, covered it pretty good. So I just remember we're doing this deal with Bitgold. I'm like, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> what, what? What's this? So, uh, so then we start following Bitgold, and uh, so the tradition is very much alive. Uh, if, if you're follow the gold money, the James Church story, which we have, and so this is um, these guys are um, taking it to the next century, really. Yeah. Uh, they're doing a good job, I think. Really good job. You just opened your account. Right. But anyway, so. Uh, <laughs>